Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Carol Hinkle, president of Triple E. I would love to welcome you to this, our second lecture of the spring series, Who Knew? So I'd love to have Michael Orlansky of our program committee now introduce today's speaker. Michael. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Today, we're very pleased and honored to welcome Dr. Benjamin Ola Akandi. From College. Dr. Akande is a prominent economist, educator, and global consultant. Before coming to Champlain last year, he was the Assistant Vice Chancellor of International Programs for Africa and Associate Director of the Global Health Center at Washington University in St. Louis. Also in Missouri, Dr. Akande served as president of Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, and at Webster University, where he was professor of economics and dean of the George Herbert Walker School of Business and Technology. Dr. Akande, a Nigerian American citizen, earned his PhD in economics at the University of Oklahoma. He did his postdoctoral studies at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and at Said Business School at the University of Oxford in England. Along with his academic posts, Dr. Akande has been a board member and consultant to many well-known corporations and nonprofit institutions in the US and abroad. When Dr. Akande was selected as president of Champlain College, his former colleague, Dr. Mark Wrighton, the distinguished longtime chancellor of Washington University, offered these thoughts, and I quote, I've known Benjamin for many years, and he is a St. Louis treasure who can creatively tackle the major challenges that now confront colleges and universities. He is an excellent communicator, a consensus builder, and sensitive to all in the community he serves, end quote. Fittingly, the title of today's lecture will be Leading in a Post-COVID-19 World, Challenges and Opportunities. We thank Sandy Eusen, Director of Communications and External Relations at Champlain for her support. Sandy, who many of you know, is with us today and will assist Dr. Akande by reading your questions aloud in the Q&A period. And as always, you can type questions into the Q&A window at any time during the lecture. Thanks. We're also grateful to Liza Gedulig, Executive Assistant to the President. Now, please join me in welcoming President Benjamin Ola Akande of Champlain College. Thank you. Hello, Michael. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I, I do consider it an honor uh, to, to be here today. And uh, I, I definitely um, look forward to the opportunity to, to be able to speak to you all today. It's, um, it's, it's indeed truly an honor to, to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, bring, put my part presentation um, uh, on, on the screen right now. And I think we should be able to, to move forward on that. Yeah, great. One of the most important and most um, challenging thing about the COVID-19 pandemic is that it, it is an equal opportunity pandemic. It, it is a pandemic that that impacted literally every single person on earth. If you lived on earth, you were impacted by COVID. And if you think about that, there are very few ever instances of anything where all of us were impacted. And, and initially we, we didn't really know the pervasiveness of this pandemic. We didn't understand how negative it will be. We, 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 we failed to recognize how difficult it will make life for us. And it was, it was sort of like, a, like an unexpected right hook 
that showed up and when we when it hit us it knocked us out and we were simply on the on the on the ground trying to recover from this unexpected right hook and i think in in so many instances many of us decided that you know what we're just going to stay down we're going to wait this out and perhaps maybe in a in a couple of months we'll be back to normal again but that has not been the case it's been very interesting because from a pervasive perspective it has essentially continued it has been one that continues to show us and to give us different avenues of impact on a daily basis and who, who could have thought perhaps maybe just a couple of weeks ago that just when we thought okay we had the new vaccines taking place that all of a sudden we got this new variant variant of, of this of this pandemic showing up they call it the south african variant that is more contagious and perhaps even more deadly and so it, it begs the question what are you doing in the midst of covid-19 you know in, in this on on the screen I, i asked the question what is your business doing but i think the reality is that what are you doing in the midst of covid-19 and and as you think about how we navigate this very interesting pandemic i think the most important aspect of this is what are we going to do differently when this is all said and done and how do we make sure that while we are still standing in the midst of covid that we're relevant that we're not less of who we are or who we were before covid that indeed moving forward that we are stronger that we are more resilient and that we're we're ready and so in my next slide i i talk about the fact that i think this is a very important decision process for for all of us and and i think that um one thing that is very clear to us is that whatever future we imagine pre covid-19 that future is of what it used to be what whatever future we envision you know and, and usually prior to 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 covid-19 it was simply the same of everything you know the same challenges that we felt from an economic cyclical perspective the same challenges that we felt from a political perspective it, it was it was pretty much predictable but because of covid-19 the future is no longer predictable and that's hard on us because what it means is that we have to be ready to do something that humans don't like to do on a regular basis and that is to change and in fact i've come to the conclusion that the only person that likes change is a wet baby because what what change does to us is that change really you know just really ruffles us up it it forces us to to get out of our comfort zone it, it 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 simply pushes us to try new things it it makes life unimaginably unimaginably uncomfortable for us and so when we know this i i think it was put probably better in context to a, a mckinsey uh, briefing sometime last year where they talked about the 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 five r's and in in their five hours they talked about having a sense of resolve and, and that is sort of being comfortable with addressing whatever challenges is in front of you and then also having a sense of resilience you know to show that you're you're not going to go away that you're not going to lay down that you're going to find a way to confront this to find a way out you know what are we going to do to cure our our sick what are we going to do to take care of our young what are we going to do to make sure that we don't continue to lose people to this crazy pandemic and what are we going to do to make sure that at the end of the day that our businesses have a sense of resilience and while we're doing all this how do we return back to normal because that normalcy is now something that is is a constant for us we we got to find a way not just to be going back to the way we did this but basically to to doing it better and 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 while we're doing all these things how can we reimagine a new future for ourselves how can we find new opportunities for ourselves and while we're reimagining because reimagining is one of the most difficult things to do because when you're reimagining you're being asked to essentially transform yourself you've been asked to to try new things and we're saying essentially 
that that's what the times call for. And, and if we do it well, if we do it well, you know, um, the, the challenge for us is that we're able to not only reimagine, but to also reform ourselves, to try something better, to be better, to be stronger. And, and I think that, that these are very, very important and very critical things that we need to think about. And I think it's, it's, it's important to ask the question that how do we become more relevant in a post-COVID world? What, what, does, what does relevance mean? And, I, and I, I share with you the way I see it. You know, when we're relevant, that means that we're, we're, we'll have an impact. When we're relevant, it means that we're we're being able to handle the different vagaries that this challenge brings us. When we're relevant, it, it, it shows that we're not going to go away. Um, and I think that, that the way we can remain relevant is to have what I call a cohesive response to the new challenges we face. And, and when, you, when you think about sort of having, having that cohesive response, some, some of the things that, that, that comes to mind is that do we, you know, we, we understand that cohesive response means that we can't handle the future by ourselves. We need to find partners. We need to lean on others. We need to listen attentively to new ideas. Uh, cohesive response is that we have to be willing to change before we have to. Co cohesive response means that we have to be open to the idea of doing things very differently. Co cohesive response means that we, we don't have to be leaders all the time, that sometimes, perhaps more importantly this time, that we need to be really good followers. And then we would also be finding ways to, to, to look at pivoting in this very unique period of time. Because if we don't do that, and then we become victims of COVID, and then we become irrelevant. And so my, my next slide speaks to the fact that in, in doing all these things, um, I, I think there are a couple of things that I want you all to take a look at. Because when we, when we think about the post-COVID competitive landscape, a couple of things have changed for us. And you know, the first one is that we're, we're gonna see what I would characterize as sort of a, an intense competitive environment and, and sort of the proliferation of consumer choices that are gonna challenge existing brands. We're going to see people introduce new products, new services that didn't have a chance of existing prior to COVID, all of a sudden show up. I was talking to a friend of mine in St. Louis just the other day, and he was telling me that this company has had a remarkable success um, during COVID. And I, I asked him, I said, well, what, what are you guys doing now? He's, and he said, well, we've, we've simply shifted our production to healthcare products because we think that even post COVID, these things are gonna be critical. And that our demand is not just uh, here in the United States, we're seeing a significant demand overseas. And, and this, this was just a consumer product um, company uh, less than nine months ago that have sort of shifted to, to a particular new area. We're, we're gonna see what we in economics characterize as flat markets and, and price inelasticity, because what, what that means essentially here is that people are going to be able to charge prices that are probably a little higher than usual and be able to get away with it. And, and because they know that the, the demand for those products are, are, are there, are necessary. And so we have to be ready for that. And then we're, we're also going to start seeing the emergence of um, what, I would, what I would characterize as um, you know, uh, offerings or, or products that are sh gonna show up literally overnight. Um, and if you thought you had a market position where you were a leader yesterday, that could be taken away from you tomorrow. And it could be taken away from you from a company that you've never heard of or a company that was just established last week. That, that's, that's the level of competitiveness that we're gonna see. And I think the last one, I think from a timing perspective is we're going to begin to see emerging competition with capacity to move quickly and to do it so well that they would change the game for us literally overnight. This is going to be what I call the new COVID landscape. And, and those are things that did not exist. Those are things that did not matter just a few, a few months ago. And so what I, when I, when I, when I want to show you 
it's a very interesting slide. I'm going to go through this one step at a time. And the first step, the first step, um, we go back one. The first step here is what I call the pre-COVID America, which is essentially we were living life as if there was no problem and we were running our organizations as if there was really no, that tomorrow wasn't going to change. And so we find ourselves uh, in so many positions as where our companies were sort of increasing at an increasing rate. Every year meant that we could gain Delta, that we would increase our productivity, increase our deliverables. It, it was great times. Um, the, the, the stock market in America was, was doing great. Um, I think to, to an extent, because um, we had a significant level of, re, of, of deregulation um, and, and things were flowing really well. But just like that, everything changed. And so we, we find ourselves in what I call the second step, which is my next point here, which I call the now, which essentially represents the eye of the storm. And, and the now is very interesting to us because the now is so unpredictable. The now doesn't really give us any kind of assurance that, that there's a real future that's gonna be good for us. We're, 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 we find ourselves in the quagmire essentially. And so I, I characterize this as being in the eye of the storm. And being in the eye of the storm meaning that there's a, there's a definitive level of unpredictability. And so what do, you, what do you do if you find yourself in the now? Well, you got a couple of options if you're an organization. You just ride the wave and hope to God that everything works out. Or you try to determine your own future, your own, your own, your own, your own legacy by, by doing something about it. Or do you find partners where you decide, you know, I can't go at this alone. I, I need to collaborate with others. You know, we, we characterize this as mergers, acquisitions, um, you know, teaming up uh, in a way that, uh, that provides strength and capacity for you from a business perspective. But I, but I think that my perspective is that one thing that we can't afford to do is to give up. And so I, I've introduced the next stage, which I call the second curve. And in this graph, you will notice that in that second curve, that second curve is, is transformational. That second curve tells you that we're not gonna give up. That second curve talks again about this issue of resiliency, transformation, capacity, in, innovation. And, and how do you get to that second curve? Well, it means you have to do a couple of things differently. It means you've got to expand your relationships. It means that you've got to embrace new technology. It means that you've got to get better at the things that you don't know well. And it means that you've got to look at the possibility of creating a new business model. Because if you, if you do all these things and then you, 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 you actually position yourself to flourish in a post-COVID America, and that's essentially what we want to do. And, and you know, the second curve uh, applies not just to organizations and industry, it, it applies to individuals. Do we build new relationships? Do we learn uh, to, to enhance and to embrace new technology? Do we, do we find ways to, to engender and to expand our knowledge base? Do we try new things that may challenge us before, but we know it's necessary? I, I really believe that this particular graph is a very significant depiction of what we need to do and the things that we need to pay attention to in a post-COVID America, whether we're individuals or whether we find ourselves in a position as organizational leaders. And then in my, in my next graph, I, I talk about the chance that one of the things that we need to be asking ourselves is that in the post-COVID world, do we still matter on those things that matter to our customers? Do we, do we matter on the things that they consider important? Now, the things that they considered important a year ago is not what they consider important now. Because today, what they consider important is they, they, they want responsiveness. They want honesty, they want candor, they want humanity, they want flexibility, they, they want trust, they want compassion, they want flexibility. And so, those are the things that matter to customers, to people now. And maybe they were not on the top list a few months ago, but surely they are now. They want safety. They want to focus on, on, on medical awareness. 
And, and so the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we still, do we still matter on those things that matter now? And I think that the answer to that question depends on the individuals, it depends on what business you're in. And then that brings me to, to my next slide. And I think that this is a very important slide because I, I think that the way that you, you define whether you matter or not is asking, you the, asking yourself the question, am I, am I relevant or, or am I irrelevant? And let me, let me tell you how I would answer that question. Um, you know, for me, if, if you're irrelevant, it means that you're, you, you're, you're losing your customers, you're losing your, 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 you're losing your impact, that you are gradually sort of moving yourself into a, what I would call a state of auspice. And but if I could use that term, because one of the things that I've noticed lately, probably in the last 10 years for me in terms of visiting my, my friends and loved ones in hospice, is that whenever I go visit them, you want to make it a happy moment. You want to make it a very important moment. You want to make it memorable for those that are in hospice. And so you, you don't talk about all the bad stuff. You talk about all the good stuff. You talk about the happiness, the, the important occasions that you had 10 years ago and how great things were 30 years ago about how um, everything worked out even maybe last year. Because what you don't talk about with somebody in, in hospice is you don't talk about tomorrow. And so organizations that find themselves in a state of hospice are simply talking about their past because either they're not willing to or they believe that perhaps the tomorrow is not going to be a good one. So they are stuck in the past. And I think it's important that we don't find ourselves in that situation, that we think about a buoyant future, that we, we dare to, to, to challenge our, ourselves about the day after tomorrow, that we don't give up. And because when you become irrelevant, it means that you're just not there anymore, that you're not thinking about beyond today anymore, that you've essentially given up. And, and so it, it, it brings me to my next slide. I think it's a very important one. And I think that we, we all need to participate in the process of auditing our relevance. And, and in auditing our relevance, it means that we've got to identify the most important and urgent issues and opportunities to our clients and to, and to assert what has changed or what needs to be changed. And I think when we, when we do an all of a, a relevance audit, it means that we need to gauge how effective our lives, our product, our services help solve issues that are important to the people that we serve, to the, to the clients that we have. And in doing an audit relevance that we we seek to find opportunities to create blue ocean, which is basically between, you know, trying to figure out where do we go next? Where do we go next where we are able to create a, a competitive landscape between our organization and the competition? Blue ocean moves you forward. Blue oceans enables you to do things that you've never done before. Blue, blue ocean is not about copying somebody's best practice. Blue Ocean is essentially creating your own next practice, what does not exist. And so I, I really believe that auditing relevance is, is an important, practical, consistent practice that we all need to do in our respective place, in our respective work. And then the next slide, I think that we, would, we need to ask ourselves the question, how will we accelerate a push to relevance in a post-COVID-19 world. I think it begins with having strategy. And that is that our capacity to re-enter, to be ready to go, to be ready to, to deal with a new normal, the challenges that we face, to know that status quo is not acceptable. I mean, status quo for me could be a very comfortable place, but nothing happens in that place. To be ready to challenge ourselves even more, more so than ever. 
And so that brings me to my next my next slide. I said and Hello, we're just trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, okay. My, my next slide basically says that to be relevant in a, in a post-COVID era, you've got to do a couple of things well. Um, one, um, you've got to understand and appreciate that the future belongs to those that are change ready those that are willing to become just like a baby and be willing to, to change and to change often if necessary. Secondly, to understand that the best opportunities are visible but not seen and that you've got to not expect that those opportunities that present itself may not be, um, may not be as, as visible as you think. And, and sometimes I think about the fact that, um, you know, when you're looking to to find those opportunities, you got to sometimes create them. And, and I think the third point I was making here is that the future isn't a place that we're going, that the future is a place that we will create. And the fourth point is that this is the best time in our lives to identify our next practice. Now, you will, you will, you will notice that I didn't say identify best practice, because best practice means it's already been done. It means that we'll just copy what somebody else has done. It's that having the courage and the audacity to do what nobody else has ever done before. And, and it's not easy. It's, it's, it's quite challenging. But I think in the times that we find ourselves, we need more creative endeavors. We, we, need, we need more pioneers. We need more people that are willing to say, I'm going to try something here to solve a problem, to create opportunity, to rise above the element. And then the last point I want to make on this slide is that for us to be able to do all these things, I think it's important that we develop the capacity to see around corner. How do you do that? Well, you gotta have the courage to even look. You have to have the strength and capacity to, to face up with what's around that corner because usually what's around that corner is something different, something new, something scary, something challenging. But then by developing the capacity and the willingness to constantly look around the corner, you're not scared of what you see. And whatever that corner presents to you, 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 you find a way to meet it heads on, not to turn around and run away from it, not to hide from it, but to find a way to solve it. And I think that's what is going to be required of us in, in a post-COVID world. And then my next slide, I think, speaks to something very important. And that is that, and I said this earlier on, we, we've got to find partners. We can't do what needs to be done by ourselves. And, and I think for us at Champlain, what we're saying to you is that as you think about your next step, whether it's going back to school, whether it's a business proposition, whether it's re-looking re, re at your business plan, that Champlain College wants to help you meet those needs. We want to do it as co-creators. We, we believe that we, we have the diversity of perspective to be able to help you in whatever way that you need to be assisted and that we can essentially do it together. And so I want you to think about what are the ways, what are the opportunities where Champlain College can become a co-creator with you. I, I end with this. I think that the future our future is going to depend on our ability to, to collaborate with each other. It's going to depend on our capacity to embrace new people in our communities. It's going to depend on our willingness to work with people that we probably didn't know last year, or probably we never really, we never really gotten to know them, but we've got to trust our instincts and to be open to the idea of partnership and collaboration. I, 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 I end with this very interesting story. 
when when I moved to St. Louis in the, in the summer of 2000, I um I was coming from Texas, West Texas, and we had lived in Texas uh, probably for about about 10 years before that, and made a lot of friends and sort of essentially we could say at that time that my kin folks lived in Texas because a lot of my family members had moved to Texas as well. And I, and I remember moving to St. Louis and the big city of St. Louis and with the Gateway Arch and the Mississippi. And I was told back in, then, then that um, Benjamin, one of the key questions that people are going to constantly ask you in St. Louis is what school did you go to? And they warned me that be very careful because that question is not as obvious as you think it is because when they ask you what school you attended, they're not talking about what university you attended. They're not talking about where you got your degree. They're asking you, what high school did you go to? Because that question is very material to trying to figure out whether you're from here or you're not. And so I was prepared. And so the first time, literally within weeks of moving to St. Louis, I was at a function and somebody walked up to me and said, you know, um, Benjamin, you know, it's good to meet you. He said, uh, what, what school did you go to, Benjamin? And I said, well, um, I, I'm not from here. I, I just got here, but I got here as quick as I could. And that just sort of broke the ice for us. And, we, and, he, and he laughed and he laughed and he said, well, well yeah, you know, Benjamin, I'm, Great. And he said, you know, what I'm actually asking you is by asking you that question, I could figure out whether you're from here. And most importantly, what part of the community you live. Because you see, St. Louis is broken down into different suburbs. And so if you say you live in town and country, that means that basically that there's a good possibility that um, your, your home is somewhere in the neighborhood of about, you know, about $750,000 to about $20 million. And if you say you live in Ladue, it means that it's probably, probably equally yoked. And if you mean you live in Webster Groves, I mean, they, they could essentially sort of place you based on where you live. And so what I did was I devised a method to, to ask the question before being asked. And whatever answer they gave me, I would then say to them, I just got here. And I'm glad I'm here. And I want to make a difference while I'm here. And I'll do my best to earn that. 20 years later, I, I, I go to St. Louis and, and I was there to visit the other day and somebody walked up to me, complete stranger. And he said, you know, how are you doing? I said, I'm good. He said, what, what, uh, what, so what high school did you go to? Then? And I said, well, I didn't go to high school here. And he said, well, if you had gone to high school, you know, Benjamin, what high school would you have attended? And I, I just never heard that one before. And I said, yeah, really? You want me to sort of take a guess what high school I would have missed? And I said, well, well you know, if I had gone to high school, um, I would have attended Mary Institute Country Day, which is one of the top um, schools, high schools in the St. Louis area. It's a private day school. And he said, Benjamin, how did you come up with that? He said, did you, do you live in Ladue? I said, well, I, I, I did when I was here in St. Louis, but I'm no longer here. I live in Vermont now. And he said, well, how did you come up with Mary Institute Country Day? I said, well, I came up with Mary Institute Country Day because three of my daughters went to school there. They graduated from there. I was on their board of trustees for six years. I enjoyed watching their football team. I embraced the very best of that institution. And I paid tuition for what was close to about 12 years, private school tuition. <laughs> and it was a laughing moment. And, so we, and then we just used that to, to move on and talk about other things and the other things that we had in common and, and the opportunities that lay ahead for us. And also gave me an opportunity to talk a little bit about my new home in Burlington, Vermont. And so as we seek to think about the future, I ask that um, if opportunity doesn't knock, that we actually build a door, enable that opportunity to find that knock so that we can open that door and welcome those opportunities. Um, 
I am, I am glad that I had this opportunity to visit with you all this afternoon. And so I, I welcome your questions and your comments. Thank you so much for having me. Michael, are we ready for questions? Uh, yes, we are standing. Okay, terrific. Well, I appreciate, uh, it looks like we do have some, some questions and um, please do add your questions to the Q&A. Um, and the first question, um, President Conde comes from Jan, who um, is pointing out that, that many of the folks in, in the audience are retirees and wondering how you would recommend auditing relevance for, um, for those folks. Um, you know, I, I think the best way to audit relevance is to think about how this pandemic has changed your life. Um, perhaps it, it's because I think for a lot of retirees and my, you know, my mom is almost 90 and my dad passed away in September, he was 94. What, what COVID did for them is that it, it really reduced their mobility and it, it reduced their access, access to their kids, access to their grandkids, um, access to their friends. And it became, it became a very lonely uh, existence for them. Um, and I think for retirees, I would, I, would, I would think about the fact that this is probably a good opportunity to start thinking about a new hobby and, um, and how we, you might want to, to do something completely different than you haven't done before. And maybe that, that hobby, I think for, for me would be, would be you know, trying something that you've never done before. And you know, it, it was, it's just like trying to introduce sort of the concept of gaming and, and the mobility of gaming to, and to travel around the world, to see places that you've never been able to even imagine that you would have a chance to visit. And it, it's, it's also a chance for, for, um, for making the best of Zooming. Um, I, I remember uh, when I first got to Champlain and I was trying to introduce myself in this community. And the challenge for me was, how do I do that when I can't meet people face to face? And so we came up with the concept of um, wine and cheese via Zoom. And so we would have wine and cheese um, via Zoom. And, and what we would do is we would actually, we'll send a bottle of uh, wine to my guest. And um, we, sometimes it was even chilled. And, and then at six o'clock when the, when the call starts, we would um, go on Zoom and we would start out by, by pouring the wine into the, into the glass. And then we would toast each other to start the conversation. And we had some wonderful discussions uh, in a wine and cheese and we would tell stories. And I, I grew up in the African tradition of storytelling because we did not have access to television all the time because there was no electricity. We didn't have access to movies. And so we just told, we told stories. And, I, and, and that's where your imagination is challenged. And I, I think, you know, you're retired. This is a chance for you to, to reconnect by telling some wonderful stories to the next generation, stories that have happy endings and stories that don't have happy endings, but they have messages and which you can extract takeaways from those stories. I, I think this, this is the time for you to share your wisdom with the next generation to, to let us know the things that we should remember and the lessons that we need to learn from our, from our past. Um, and I think that our, our, our older generation, they, they could, this could be a remarkable opportunity for us to be able to do that in, in the midst of this COVID. And, and then to, to stay healthy by, by making sure that even though you may not be able to go out as much, but to be able to walk around the house more and to walk around the yard more and to, to, to do those regular exercises, um, I think those are very important that will keep us vibrant and keep us engaged. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, another question. So this is, how, how does some of this apply to Champlain and specifically what changes do you envision at Champlain College post pandemic? Well, you know, for, for us, what we did post pandemic is that we, we, ind we introduced one of the key aspects called flex hybrid. And for us, the flex hybrid was our way of um, enabling our students to be able to, to do two things, to be able to come back face to face or to come back through, through um, a virtual reality, very similar to this. 
And, and what that does is it, it provided a duality of options for not just our students, but also our faculty. And we, we made it happen in real time where faculty is able to teach from their respective homes, or they can teach from their classes in an empty class, and they can have their students join them. And I think that Flex Hybrid for us was an important pivot moment, but what, what it also did for us is that it positioned us for, for the future post-COVID. Because I think that in the future of post-COVID, the, the ability to be able to go to school in so many formats is going to be important. And to do it in a way that is as real as being there is also very critical. And I think that was one of the key important aspects for us. Secondly, we, we took very seriously the notion of, of safety and health, not just for our students, faculty, and staff, but for our community. And so we put in a very stringent COVID response um, um, strategy that, that laid out what we considered responsible living, that, that pretty encouraged our students to be good citizens of this community. And I think secondly, we also made sure that we had a very significant regimen of testing, weekly testing, that ensured that if you were on campus and you were attending classes on campus, that we, we demanded and we requested that you test every week. And that allowed us to be able to monitor possible spread of, of the pandemic. And I think it really turned out for us because it, we, we were able to have some, the lowest positivity rate um, among American universities. It, it, was, it was also good because it was, our positivity rate was lower than Vermont. And Vermont was one of the, one of the best um, um, states in the country when it came to positivity rates. And so I think from, from, from Champlain's perspective, that was, a, that was our response that turned out pretty, pretty effectively. Um, and I think that the lessons from that is for us not to take anything for granted, um, for us to work out those challenges that life presents us. We may not have a, we, we may not have a choice what cards we're dealt, but what we have a choice in is how we play it. And we played it for the safety of our faculty, staff, and students, and for the safety of our community. Um, that, that was very important to us. And, and I think for us, we were also looking out for isolation for our students. We wanted to make sure from a mental health perspective that we paid attention to them. Because, you know, this generation is, is a very interactive generation. But when they're, when there's, when they, when they're isolated, um, that's when really bad things happen. And so how do we make sure that we don't isolate them, that we keep them fully engaged? And, and I think that's been one of the big, big challenges and opportunities for us in this um, in this crisis. Benjamin, that gets to another question that has come up in, in the Q&A, which is as, as colleges and universities reimagine themselves to adapt to COVID-19 by increasing remote instruction, do we foresee that the more personal aspects of the college experience, such as living and interacting with fellow students could be diminished or lost? So you've touched on some of that, but maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, you know, Sandy, I, I don't think the personal touch is, is diminished. It's just delayed. So what do we do in the meantime? And how do we use this, this crisis as a way to find other means of engaging each other? I mean, what we did um, in, in, in Jack Champlain is one of our faculty members, Dr. Noreen Hall, um, created this concept called In Space that allowed us to, to be able to interact and navigate in, in space, in, in sort of an, an expanded or an advanced Zoom experience where you, you can walk into a room, walk into a classroom, look to the left and look to the right and see who's sitting next to you in class and look up front and see your, your teacher and be able to move around in the classroom. Uh, that's, that, that, the crisis led to that invention for her. And I think that's critical. Um, and, and I think that um, how, how do we use this crisis as a moment in time to invent, to recreate, to reimagine, to be resilient? Um, you know, that's, that's what we've sought to do. So yeah, I, I think that interaction is delayed, but it's not completely out of the picture. And we've got to find a way to, to, to find other means to be able to engage each other in the meantime. And, and I think that's going to demand a level of creativity for all of us. Great, there's a question about uh, whether Champlain has had more international or more uh, very distant students during the pandemic. We can talk about some of our... 
or study abroad programs, of course, that the pandemic has. Well, sure. I, I think one of the things that COVID has done is basically essentially close the borders um, because people can't travel across borders like they used to. I mean, even the Canadian border, which is just literally next door, um, has been shut down. And so how do we continue to engage and provide experiences where we have to do it through virtuality? And that's what we've done. Uh, our campuses in Montreal and campuses in Dublin, have, have, I've had to experience that. Uh, but that, that has not kept us from being able to deliver really, really good curriculum and really good outcomes. Um, and, and so we, we basically paused, you know, sort of that international aspect there because, because of health regulations and so forth and so on. But I think moving forward, how do we make sure that our institution continues to have relevance and international engagement post COVID? Well, it means that we gotta understand that maybe we're not gonna be able to have this face-to-face -face, um, for some time. So we need to find other avenues for, you, for us to use this as a pivot moment um, and, and, and to be creative and innovative in the, at the same time. And, and I think that's essentially what's going on right now with all of us all higher educational institutions that have, have, have had international students attend our schools. This is a question and a, and a comment, I think, together, but um, it's, uh, have we not adopted and embraced change already? The way our children are educate, now educated is just one example. And I know you've oh, talked about the, con the consistency of change. <laughs> we've embraced change because we've had to. We've had no choices when they when they cut when they closed down the schools and said this, the kids will go to school online. There's no choice, um, and when when you embrace change when there's no choice, it's it's even more challenging. But that's essentially what has happened, um, you know. So what do we what do we need to do differently? Um, I I think that we need to be you know so open the valve for change and be welcome and, and welcome that possibility because that's going to be a constant, that's going to be a consistency for us moving forward. Um, change is going to continue to show up on a regular basis for us, and we have to be prepared and ready to, um, to embrace it, to confront it. Great. Uh, this question uh, is, what future is available in liberal arts programs? And I know, you know, we have a really unique approach to um, liberal arts and general education through our core program that you can talk about? You know, for, for us, um, we're, 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 we are as, an institution as a professional schools, but that's a real appreciation for liberal arts. Um, but I think the future for liberal arts program is about developing curriculum that are not singly focused on one area. Um, I think the future for us is we're looking at so creating what we call an interdisciplinary array of programs where the majors that we will create moving into the future, the ones that we're creating even now, are programs that allow our students to be able to do different things as life moves on. And, and so that it, they're not just confined to a specific area. And I think the liberal arts is gonna to have to borrow that page as well, because um, what, what you graduate in today may be may be obsolete tomorrow. So the best way to do it is to make sure that you, you, you pick a program that has a variety area of outlets and opportunities. And so as life changes, you can change with it without having to go back to school. And so our, our perspective is to, is to look at that discipline of curriculum creation that is, that is sort of transitional. Um, and, and what we're doing is that we're already creating programs that reflect that. Um, you know, for, for instance, we just um, announced just a few weeks ago they, a new program called Apps Development. And what Apps Development is essentially, we're saying that moving into the future, apps are going to be doing literally everything for us. And, and so how do we prepare for that future? How can we be empowered to create that future? And I think that's, that's going to be the real challenge for us moving forward. And, and that's why the creation of these concepts and these, these perspectives will, will enable our students' come, uh, uh, degrees to be, to be relevant way, way, way into the future. And, and I think that's, that's actually necessary. And then those, those, those regular skill sets, the ability to communicate, 
the ability to to lead others, uh, the the ability to um, to to articulate a position and to get others to listen, and consequently to buy in. Um, you know, the the ability to embrace others that may look different than you, they may have an accent, they may not be from your neighborhood, they may not be from Vermont. Um, I have to say to you guys, one of the most challenging situations for me as president of Champlain uh, over the last six or seven months, eight months, is the loneliness that, that COVID has created and the inability to be able to meet anybody, to be able to get to know people. Um, for someone like myself that basically built my career on engaging people, um, whether it was when I was in Oklahoma, when I was in Texas, or when I was in Missouri, um, that's been a challenge for me personally, uh, because we've all been isolated. Um, and in a community that is really seeking to embrace diversity and inclusion, um, it's, it, was, it was sort of a missed opportunity. Um, how do we do that better? How do we bring people that are new to this community? How do we find a way to embrace them? Um, I think those would be some of the challenging questions and things that we need to think about. And that actually leads into another question that was asked. In reimagining higher education institutions during COVID, how can we ensure that students from historically marginalized and economically disadvantaged backgrounds are fully and fairly included? Hmm. First of all, you got to give them the opportunity to be here by making sure that you recruit them. Uh, because um, I, I think what we have here is that, you know, um, Vermont is, um, um, is a unique state. And so with, with very little diversity, I think. And so how do you convince people to come here? Um, because it's just not getting here that's sufficient. It's feeling that you're welcome here. Um, it's feeling that people are actually willing to, to listen to you, that they are not going to come to any conclusion and that you would be embraced with, with all, all the mightiness and beautiness of this place. Um, I, I think this, is, this community is a, is a beautiful place, it's a wonderful place with so many attractions. And I think that we need to make an extra effort to try to welcome students here from very diverse backgrounds by, by being a warm place, by being a place that embraces them. I, I, I really believe that's going to be uh, the best way to do that. It's not going to be easy. No, it's going to be challenging. Yes, but I think it's actually doable. There is a question. Have more students from afar enrolled in Sh at Champlain to study in your programs online? Could you, could, you, could you capture that again, Sandy? Have more students from afar enrolled at Champlain to study in your um, programs online, and I'm I'm thinking maybe this is, um, you know, Champlain College online, yeah. where yeah. our students are are from really all over the world. The the answer to that question is yes. We've seen an increase in students coming to uh, coming to Champlain from far distances, and in essence, that was the reason for the creation of Champlain College online, to give us a chance to have a reach that is way beyond um, Burlington. And we've been very successful at that. But most importantly, we've continually created new programs, certificates, badges that reflect what the market needs. Well, one of the key aspects of the pandemic is just the recession that followed and that so many people lost their jobs. And so our Champlain College Online has been an opportunity for students to, um, the adult students to basically re-engage, to come back to classes, to, to pick up certificates, to, to pick up courses that essentially positions them for, for future success. Um, and we've seen we've seen that number gradually rise over over a period of time over the last eight six or seven months. And, and I think to an extent, the, the reason for that is because of the economic you know, changes. But more importantly, our ability to have our faculty and staff and leadership in Champlain College Online to be responsive to the changing marketplace. Uh, I think hats off to them because they they, rep they recognized the importance of pivoting of changing in the midst of, of COVID. Uh, the last question I have here, and again, I encourage folks to put their questions into the Q&A, uh, is what is the level of learning 
during remote learning as, a, as compared to active engagement. So back to that, how are our students experiencing remote learning? Versus well, you know, I think you have to look at two generations here. The, the, the younger generation, the 18 to 22 year olds, they're very comfortable with, with being able to navigate the internet and to navigate um, simulations and games and because that's, we, we, we brought them up in that environment. For them, uh, Wi-Fi is an oxygen that they, they need. Without it, they can't, they can't survive and they've learned to live with it. And, and so they're, they're navigating this, this moment um, uniquely. Um, I think the challenge for them is that they were able to simply step away from it, step away from this. So for them, it was, a, it was an escape, but now it's become reality. Um, and now the escape is to be able to move from that that virtuality to, to what used to be their day to day. And how do we make sure that we balance that? Um, how, how do we make sure that, 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 that they don't find themselves confined or isolated, uh, that, 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 that there's a new balance of sorts? Um, and, I, and I think that we're also trying to, trying to find new and creative ways of teaching and learning and, and making it sure so that it's not it's not just from eight o'clock to five o'clock, that it's a continuous process throughout, throughout the day. Um, and, and, and the ability to be engaged anytime, anywhere, any place. I think that's interesting. I think that's creative. Um, and I think that's, we'll see more and more of that as, as, um, as we move forward in the post-COVID America. Thank you. And those are the questions that we have, unless anybody has any other questions they would like to raise. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Conde. This was wonderful to be able to see past the end of this. We're all looking forward to that. Yes. And I want to wish you and all the viewers a very, very happy Valentine's Day. Thank you so much. Wishing every one of you guys a very happy Valentine's Day and eat lots of cookies, give out some candies and um, give out some virtual hugs to, yeah. to all those that you love. And, um, and so I, I thank you all for the opportunity to, to be with you all this afternoon. Um, thank you for having me and um, God bless. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.